What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jess Beagle, joined today by a special guest that many of you already know, Scott Kaplan. He's on ESPN LA. He's the founder of Sided, and he is also Kaplan and crew down in San Diego for our friends down there. Scott, you uh, you made an appearance at uh, there you go, there you go. We got the Kaplan. Right. Here. Uh, you made an appearance on any territory up at Dodger Stadium, sitting right behind home plate with our guy. Greg Bergman, uh, that was that must have been quite an experience. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've never been to Dodger Stadium. I've lived in San Diego wow. for 24 years. And with all the games that the Padres have played in Dodger Stadium over the last 24 years, you know, you'd think at some point I'd actually drive up there. And I've yeah. driven by Dodger Stadium so many times and gone, gosh, I can't believe I've never been to Dodger Stadium. And I'm going to tell you something, and you know this, Jeff, better you know than I do, certainly. But what an awesome experience it is to be at Dodger Stadium. You know, I grew up as a kid in New York, and we would drive by Yankee Stadium. And I, as a little kid, I was like, wow, Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And I had that same feeling when I drive by Dodger Stadium. First time in, um, incredible, like, nostalgia and history. Yeah. And, you know, it reminds me of Yankee Stadium, the shape, the height. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, too, because Dodger Stadium is an old school stadium where it's ballpark, parking lot. Yeah. That's it. You know, um, that's what Qualcomm Stadium used to be in San Diego, even though it was a you know dual use stadium. But in in San Diego, Petco Park, that's one of those new downtown. Everybody walks the streets, hits the bars, you know. Um, so two really very different experiences. One is the modern day Petco, the uh, all the modern conveniences, all the food choices and everything that really represents local. And then Dodger Stadium is all the history and uh, and the old school feel. Um, I love them both. I yeah. do. I, I, it's but uh, Dodger Stadium was awesome. And then what an experience because because uh, you know of course I have to make sure all my radio listeners take a load of of what I like to do. And there I was sitting front row, brother. Yeah, <laughs> hey, you can't escape. You're just you're right there. There's no there's no getting off the TV screen. Now I mean I imagine you're not rooting for the Dodgers at this game. I was not like rooting against the Dodgers. I'm not like um, this lifelong Padres bleed brown, you know, kind of. I, I just, the Padres, I've been a part of covering the Padres. And, you know, when I, from so many years in San Diego, um, I had a very deep relationship with the Padres. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, the radio station 1090 back in the day, when they were building Petco Park back in 2004, you know, I helped this is going back into a deeper story, but I helped broker a deal between the Padres and 1090. We then, we were the home of the Padres from 2000, probably four when they opened Petco park through about 2016, 17. And in so many different iterations, you know, it, back then you could become friends with people. Like I was close with Bruce Bochy. I was close with Kevin Towers, their general manager. I was close with their president uh, at the time, a guy named Bob Visas. And then I used to play golf every Saturday with Sandy Alderson. And I'm not trying to name drop, even though I'm doing a really good job of it. Um, but we were close, you know, yeah. we were business relationship close. And and so um, I've been around the organization a long time. I'm not some Dodger hater. I, how could you hate the Dodgers? Honestly, like if you're a Padre fan, you hate the Dodgers, you do. But like Mookie Betts is likable. Freddie yeah. Freeman's relatively likable. Um, yeah. Otani's uh, Otani, even though people I think who aren't Dodger fans were rooting against him to be, you know, like be torn down, you know, uh, Will Smith is likable. They're just, I like the Dodgers. I don't hate the Dodgers, but I'm a Padres uh, supporter and I want to see San Diego at some point get what I've seen like cities like Kansas City have where, yeah. you know, it's a smaller market team, even though they, they pay like a big market all of a sudden. Um, I want to see the city of San Diego get that chance to bring a championship home. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk Dodgers Padres. That's why we're here. We Dodgers travel to San Diego uh, this evening, this afternoon. Padres are 20 and 20. They're in second place in the National League West. They're six and a half games back. Um, what are the vibes like in San Diego? How are people disappointed in this team? Are they excited about this team? Where are they at? I think people are um, they're cautiously excited about this this weekend um, because, you know, the Padres did beat the Dodgers two out of three in Dodger Stadium. And by the way, once that happened, that sort of set the Dodgers off. Right. I mean, they've had a couple of different winning streaks now, six games, then a loss, then seven games and a loss. But th the point is, is that um, Padre fans got excited when the Padres beat the Dodgers two out of three. And then the Padres didn't really capitalize on that when they had yeah. opportunities to do that. I think that Padre fans are excited for this reason. 
coming into the new into this season, and I know you and I talked about this in the past. You know, um, losing Juan Soto meant bringing in a bunch of arms from the Yankees, and people were excited about that. And you're going to see one of those arms tonight because Michael King is going to pitch against Tyler Glass now. King hasn't been great. He's been okay. He's yeah. sort of what the Padres are. He's three and three. They're 20 and 20, you know? Yeah. Gives up a lot of home runs, by the way. I think people were excited about what, what the Padres were able to get in return because everybody knew they couldn't sign Juan Soto. But where the Padre fans got really excited was right before the start of the season when the Padres made a move for Dylan Cease. Yeah. To go out and get a frontline starting pitcher, that was a great move. It said to everybody, the Padres are in it to win it. Yeah. The thing is, is that you Darvish has been hurt so far already this year, and he's an older guy. And Joe Musgrove has not returned to form from two years ago. And now he's also, you know, on, on the injured list. Yeah. So if it wasn't getting Dylan Cease, I think a lot of people would be really upset right now and really concerned. Then just recently, the acquisition of a real DH consistent slap the ball all over the park kind of a hitter in a rise, the guy that they got from Miami, yeah. who you know, a lot of people don't even know who he is, but I mean, even though he led the league in batting average last year, to bring a guy like that into this lineup, because you got to understand, Machado, Tatis, and Bogarts have not really lived up to the billing or the contracts this year so far. Yeah. And yeah. you've got a guy like Jerickson Profar, who's like your offensive leader, who's yeah. a million dollar left fielder. Yeah. So I think people are, are they're optimistic because you got a starting pitcher, a frontline starting pitcher. You went out and you just got a really, really good batting average, sort of a hitter. Yeah. And you're 20 and 20 when the big money guys haven't really performed yet. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, look, the C signing, I, I said on our show, I, I loved Dylan Cease is a guy, you know, obviously the Dodgers go get Yamamoto and Glass now, so I'm not complaining about the guys that they chose to go after. But Cease was was the starter of the free agents that I was I, I was interested in, and he's been fantastic. But it is an interesting spot, like you say, where you, you almost, the fact that you're 20 and 20, despite, you know, I was looking at some of the numbers, the way these guys have pitched, especially the last 30 days, the way they've mm -hmm. hit the last couple of weeks, it hasn't been totally awesome from the mm -hmm. guys you mentioned. Hasso Kim's also not been very good. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of can talk yourself into, well, if just a couple of these guys get going, if Musgrove comes back, then we've got something. Um, I wanted to talk about Arias. He, he's an interesting cat because he's sort of a throwback. Um, I, you know, hitting 400 since coming over to the Padres. I know not to take everything I see on, on social media as representative of a larger. I saw some Tony Gwynn comparisons to Arias. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, what's, I, I understand it sort of, but Tony Gwynn to me from the outside feels like hallowed ground that it's like, yeah, it's, there's there's a twenty percent similarity, but Tony Gwynn's Tony Gwynn. Like, yeah. what what has that been like in Padres land? It's funny you say that because it's kind of like um, I'm sure you know the two of us both know this well. But like when you look at Caleb Williams at USC and being the number yep. one overall pick, what did everybody say? They're like, oh, he's the next Patrick Mahomes. Yep. You know, and it's like, okay, yeah, he can run around and he has different throwing arm angles and stuff, and he's a creative playmaker. But come on, man, really, he's the next Patrick Mahomes already. Yeah. And yeah. and the thing is, is you're right. Tony Gwynn is hallowed ground. You know, um, Tony Gwynn, if you come to Petco Park, you're going to see way out in the outfield in what they call Gallagher Square, and they redesigned it this year, and it's more it's more fan-friendly, and it's, it's really an awesome place to be. The Tony Gwynn statue was actually moved to sit right up top, so it's as if Tony Gwynn, I actually get the shows, it's as if Tony Gwynn is way up top in the statue, and he's looking down over all of Petco Park. And it really, Petco Park is the house that Tony Gwynn built, that he really never got a chance to play in. In fact, real quick side story, in 2004, when the park opened, I swear to you, at, for all the pregame festivities of the very first day, I was standing right there, man, at home plate, and they brought Tony Gwynn out from right field because he was never going to play there. But it was, it was a symbolic moment that it was the house that Gwynn had built. Um, Arise, the reason people make this comparison is because Tony Gwynn was such an uh, – this is going to sound really baseball dorky. He was a very artistic hitter. Yeah. You know, he could slap the ball around all over the place. You know, most people, at least, you know, people who don't play major league baseball, we just think you swing and you hope to hit, you know, and wherever it goes, it goes, you know, Tony Gwynn had an idea of where he wanted to put the ball and he was able to do that 30% of the time, you know, and arise is kind of that same sort of a hitter, He's not going to hit a bunch of home runs. He's going to bloop the ball into a you know a shallow outfield you know place where where a fielder can't get to it. He's going to get on base. He's going to he's going to score runs. 
Um, the best part about them, though, from what I've seen so far, is again not really following the Marlins and not knowing that much about them. He seems to be like an energy vibe clubhouse sort of guy. And that first night that he played for the Padres, he had four hits. Yeah, first guy in the history of, of the Padres to make a debut and have four hits. And then after the game, they're like, so how was it? He's like, oh, man, I love this team. I love this clubhouse. Like, Bro, you just got here. You yeah. know, but he's but he's got that sort of positive vibe around him. I love it. it. Well, and look, when you're coming from the Marlins to the Padres, I'm sure wherever you go to next, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> but of all the teams, I mean, you look around the clubhouse and you see the names that are in the Padres clubhouse. It's got to feel good. What was, I mean, it is interesting. You mentioned the Soto trade, Michael King, like you said, on the mound tonight. It's so interesting, again, not being in everything that's happening in San Diego. I see them trade Soto, who's incredible. One of the best players in baseball has continued to be that. Like you said, he the odds of the, the Padres being able to re-sign him were basically zero. So it's kind of like on paper, I can understand, hey, we're going to move this guy. We're going to try and get something back. While at the same time, then moving prospects to go get a guy like Luis Arias, like is our are, are Padres fans, do they make, can they make sense of that? Like, does it, does it make sense to the people in San Diego where they have the sort of self-awareness to say, hey, we weren't going to get Soto. So the fact that like, we're trying to build this thing while also recognizing we're the San Diego Padres and not the New York Yankees. Like, are people able to to make sense of selling one guy and buying another? 100%. Because you have to understand that at least in my 20 plus years in San Diego, we were always sold. I would go so far as to say brainwashed to believe that the Padres would never be able to compete with the Dodgers from a spending perspective because of the difference of the big market team like the Dodgers who have, you know, massive local television deals yeah. and all oh, the little Padres and they'll never have big money, local television deals. And then last year, I'm not sure yeah, if you know this or not, but last year their television deal fell apart. Yeah. You know, they, the, the company literally went out of business and the Padres were standing there with their bat in their hand going, what do we do? You know, yeah. where, where do we televise? And so, um, I think Padre fans are very realistic and they understand that we have never seen this organization spend the way it has to have Manny Machado, um, in a, on a 10 year, $350 million deal to have Fernando Tatis on a 14 year, 300 plus million dollar deal to go out and sign a guy like Xander Bogarts, which to me, I will say to you is, has been the biggest mistake and, and waste of money that they could have ever done. And they'll never be able to get rid of that contract. I don't think yeah. unless he all of a sudden starts coming around. Um, even, even a guy like Jake Cronenworth, they signed to a hundred plus million dollar deal. Um, they gave Darvish money. They gave money to, uh, to Musgrove. So there, there, there are guys here in San Diego that are making more money and the payroll is, is more so than yeah. ever before. But I'll just say one thing, Jeff, you ready for this? Yeah. This ballpark has never, has never been electric like this. It's Believe awesome. me, man. I was I was at games in in you know the early days of this ballpark where the Padres had a Jake Peavy on the mound, okay, against the St. Louis Cardinals, and in, in the playoffs, by the way, couldn't sell it out, and there were a lot of Cardinal fans. Now Petco Park is literally electric, and oh by the way, any Dodger fans that are coming to San Diego this weekend, I'm sure there'll be plenty of them, bro. Uh, get there early. Because you don't understand, in downtown San Diego this weekend, you're going to have the Padres Dodgers, 45,000 people for every game. And there's a music festival called Wonderfront happening in downtown San Diego, like across the street. And that's okay. probably going to have 40,000 people every day. The town is going to be electric this weekend. Yeah. No, I'm looking it up. Wonderfront. I mean, look, we got Weezer coming out on Saturday. Like, this looks like a pretty solid lineup here. It is. It is a good festival. And uh, and they moved it because it used to be um, in November, in the week before Thanksgiving, when there that's kind of the quietest week of tourism yeah. in San Diego. And they moved it. I'm like, what are you people? Did nobody look and see that the Padres are playing the Dodgers this weekend? Right. 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 Forget any baseball and any any homestand is probably a bad idea, let alone this one. Um, OK, so three games. You got King on the mound. You got Waldron on the mound, and you've got you Darvish on the mound for the Padres. Uh, I was just looking up numbers. King, 4.8 ERA last 30 days. Waldron, 6.5 ERA last 30 days. Darvish, at least, has been better, like a 1.8 ERA. Um, the hard part is you're going against, you know, Glass now tonight. Um, you've got Walker Bueller, James Paxton. So it, it's Glass now, and then a couple guys that are a little bit questionable. We talked right at the beginning expectations. 
would would anything less than taking two out of three be a failure for Padres this weekend? I mean, I think that if you're the Padres um, and you win this series, you have something to really be excited about, both in yeah. that clubhouse and and you know in that ballpark and within that fan base. If the Padres were able to win this series, um, you got something to be excited about. On the other hand, you know, um, you know, you look at Waldron just as an example. You know, he's sort of advertised as a knuckleballer. He's not really like a true old school Tim Wakefield kind of knuckleballer, but he's got a knuckleball in his repertoire. It's it's just that he has not been very good, you know. And and that's like for me, you know, the, the Padres have given you Dylan Cease. They've gone out and gotten uh, you know a hitter. I would love to see them add another frontline starting pitcher because you don't know if Musgrove's going to come back, and you don't know if Darvish can stay healthy. Um, and, and when you look at the flip side with the Dodgers, you know, uh, when you see Walker Bueller and in his first game back, he goes four innings. Um, I know we were having a lot of conversation on seven ten. like, what would be your expectations? Some people were like three innings. And I was like, ah, I'd like to see five innings. And he wound up going four innings. I mean, I got to think Walker Bueller is just going to keep on coming back and getting stronger and going further. Um, yeah. and Paxton, you know, I like Paxton also. So, I mean, listen to me, um, uh, Michael King. Not great. You know, he's a guy who was a, a relief pitcher with the Yankees, who's now a starter with the Padres. He's a three and three guy. Like I mentioned earlier, he gives up a lot of home runs. To me, pitching advantage at least two out of the three games because Walker Bueller's still kind of a wild card in all of this. Pitching yeah. advantage goes to the Dodgers this weekend. And and one of one of the guys on my podcast every day, uh, his name's Alex Padilla. He's a really super smart baseball guy. He always said, and he grew up going to Dodger Stadium because he's from Oxnard. And now he's a hardcore Padre fan. He always says this, hey, Dodger fans, how does it feel to see your guys actually perform? The guys who are paid, Mookie, Freddie, Otani, Will Smith, uh, Hernandez, the guys that actually are making the money, they perform. How does that feel? Because Machado, Tatis, Bogarts, we don't know how that feels, yeah. you know, because they don't really perform. So I, I, to me, listen, I'll say this. Um, I think the Dodgers can come down here and win this series. I think the Dodgers can come down here the way they're playing. I think they could sweep this series. Yeah, the, the Padres have a little bit of momentum, um, but the Dodgers are far and away the better team, and the Dodgers are going to run away with this division. And if yeah. the Padres could somehow win this series, they got a lot to build on. Yeah, it, it was funny. I was trying to figure out, like, all right, what's the – just looking at sort of the record-wise and schedule, and I'm like, okay, how are the Padres doing? And I laughed because I was like, I could present the Padres in three different ways. I could say, hey, this is a team that just took two out of three from the Cubs. This is a team that's won six of their last eight. Or I could say this is a team that has is six and seven in their last 13 games. Like all three of those statements are true. They were on a losing streak. Then they won on a bit of a winning streak. They've won two of their last three. And so it feels like, you know, even just hearing you talk and sort of following from afar, it feels like that's the story of the Padres season. Like depending yeah. on the day you catch them, they're going to look like the Padres that you'd expect, which is one of the best teams in baseball. And then there's other stretches where it's just going to feel like, wait a minute, where, where's Tatis? Where's Machado? You know, where are yeah. these guys at? I mean, just to capitalize on what you were just saying, think about it like this. Are the Padres the team that split four games with Colorado and Denver? Are the Padres the team that is three and three with Michael King when he's starting? Yeah. Are the Padres just what their record says, which is 20 and 20? Um, or are the Padres a team that have all of a sudden won three straight series? Yeah. You know, and it's it's really, you know, hard to tell. And I know that we're 40 games in and people like to say it's early, it's early, it's early until all of a sudden it's late. Yeah. Um, but here's, I would say here's who the Padres are. The Padres are a team that are fortunate to be where they are, 500 and in second place when neither Machado, Tatis, or Bogarts have really been themselves yet. Yeah. No, I, and that's the beauty of baseball, right? It, it's like the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You can talk yourself into 20 and 20 as either, hey, if if a couple of these guys start, then that all of a sudden it's going to be, you know, it's going to be 25 and 15 over the next 40. Or it's, man, why aren't these guys hitting? We're lucky to be 20 and 20. It's going to be 15 and 25 over the next 40 unless these things figure it out. So yeah. that's the beauty yeah. of baseball. That's the beauty of all this. It's a three-game series. We get to overreact at the end of the weekend regardless. Um, Scott, let folks know where they can find you. Talk to us about Sided and, uh, and, and where they can find out all your stuff. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, a couple of different things. Number one, for most of your viewers, 
Um, you guys can catch up to me on ESPN 710 in the afternoon from 4 to 7. I'm on with me, George Sedano, and our entire crew. And uh, and George has become like very much a uh, wannabe Dodger fan. And I say it like that because he grew up in Miami and he came to L.A. like six, seven years ago. And he has, you know, he brags that he has adopted the the Dodgers. So he really wants to talk Dodgers. And, and listen, with Otani being on the Dodgers, to me, that's comparable to LeBron being on the Lakers. It makes them that much more interesting. So you can catch us every day, Monday through Friday from four to seven on ESPN L.A. If um, if you would be so inclined and you uh, you want to turn the radio dial. My podcast actually airs on 1090, which is the radio station that I was, you know, that was my home radio station for like 20 years. So now I take my podcast called Kaplan and Crew and I actually air it on the radio. Uh, right. So that's between 3 and 6 p.m. every day. And then lastly, when you ask about side, and I really appreciate that, you know, Dodger Blue is such a great partner of ours. Anybody who's on the Dodger Blue website, if you look on the right side of the page, you're going to see a poll and that poll is powered by sided. So today's poll I can see up front says, which rookie has impressed you the most? Gavin Stone, Andy Pahez, or Yamamoto? I, that's a good question. It is. I, I got to say, um, I got to think, I, I'm going to go with Yamamoto. Yeah. Um, and well, by the way. Three guys, three guys with different levels of expectations, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got Yamamoto who signed the biggest contract ever. You got Pahez who nobody expected to be up this soon. And then you've got Stone, who was the top 50 prospect a year ago, but who stunk last year. So it's depending on what your bar is. I, I It's a great question. 54% um, of people say Pahez so far. 33% say Yamamoto. That's how I voted. And 12% uh, say Stone. The next question, that because it, it'll just keep going. Uh, do you think the Dodgers having such a huge lead in the division already is good or bad for the team? <laughs> I, I'm going to go with good. Uh, yeah. I know if the, the Padres had that kind of lead. I know everybody would be pretty psyched about that down here. Um, and this just goes on and on and on. So the more you vote, the more polls you're going to get. And uh, I'll tell you, man, people get caught up in these things. We've got some data that will show you how many people vote on one, how many vote on two, how many vote on 15. So we love working with Dodger Blue and, uh, and I love coming on this podcast, Jeff. Thank you, man. Well, we appreciate it, folks. You can find Scott at Scott Kaplan. And uh, again, check out all of his radio stuff, uh, especially the ESPN LA stuff where he's, yeah. where he's talking a little bit of Dodgers and that kind of thing. So, Scott, thank you as always for your time, folks. Thanks for watching us here. Uh, we will be live tonight after the Friday night game. Myself and Anthony Wittrato talking Dodgers Padres, uh, hopefully after a glass now gem, a Dodgers win, but we'll see. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day, folks. As always, go Dodgers.